relentless joy starts with a baby boy. Man, words like that, we just don't say that anymore. You know, we just don't, we don't live that. That kind of joy, that kind of endless hope, that kind of stuff is, it's hard to find today. You know, it just seems like we're constantly pursuing something that will give us just a little bit of life. You ever feel like that? Like, if I could just squeeze one moment of enjoyment out of this. You know, if I could just enjoy my job just a little bit, I feel like I could get through it till tomorrow. If I could just do this, if I could just do that. But the thing is that we try to squeeze life and joy out of things that literally have none in them. They're empty. We struggle all the time to get that. Now, here's the thing that's great about the holidays, right? The holidays are an unbelievably valuable time for us. Not, not the way we do them all the time. Do you remember when you were a kid? Like, Christmas just seemed like it took forever to get here. Remember that? Like, you'd go to, like, it seems like every single day would drag on, and you'd anticipate Christmas. But now it seems like trick-or-treaters walk across the thing, and then the next minute you're shopping, and you put the tree up, and then it's Christmas, then it's New Year's, you take the tree down, you know, maybe in February, you know, like, and so, like, you go through this thing, and it's just like, it goes like that, right? And all the while, we're just trying to chokehold any kind of, of life, out of the things that we go through day to day. I don't know about you, but, but I don't like that. I don't like feeling like that. The holidays are a great time. This, kind of, this time of year is a great time for people like us to do a lot of different things. I, I was thinking through this this week, what holidays are a great time for some stuff. It's a time, you know, for a little extra time off work, you know? You get a little extra, at least a couple of days, right? Some of you are shut down for a week or so this time of year. Some of you get, like between Christmas and New Year's, there's some space in there where you can get kind of just a little bit of break. And to be honest with you, that's a great time for us to kind of just step away from life, like we do every week when we take communion, kind of settle the noise, and just get a little bit of perspective, even if it's just a minute on Christmas Eve, right? Just taking that pause to refine a couple of moments just to look at life and kind of just say, hey man, where are we at in this? The holidays are a great time for that. The holidays are are a great time to be extra generous, you know, to be kind of kind and loving to people. I mean, I've loved getting to hear some of the stories that folks are telling me. You know, they're like, hey, you know, I was You know, I I love it because it's not bragging, you know, but you're just being able to take a second to kind of, you know, make note of some of the ways that you've been able to just kind of connect with people, help somebody find some Christmas presents, you know, care for somebody who needs, feed someone who is hungry. Those those are great things. But I want to just take a minute while we're talking about generosity um, to handle a little bit of family business. Now, We don't do that a lot around here, especially on the weekend, because there's a lot of folks, a lot of you are here uh, maybe for the first time, a couple of you here for the second or third time, whatever's going on. And I want you to know, we handle some things here, but we don't handle a lot of family business. But this is one of the only times where we're all together. And I just want to handle a couple of things really quickly before we move on, because they really um, talk directly to what we're dealing with and what we're talking about. In fact, right after the holidays, you're going to hear that this time of year is a, is a really new thing for us. This plan is for next year, for 2020, is unbelievable. I mean, it's literally the very best stuff we've done. In fact, a lot of the things that you're going to hear that we're going to do are so brand new that we've never done anything like them before. Like, we've always had a budget, but we've never had a budget like the one that we put together. Because this one is entirely developed by leaders and teams and kind of spread out all over the place and everybody's pushing back together so that we can together accomplish something great. Um, In fact, right after the holidays, you're going to hear about an event uh, called Fast Track. And if you're interested in stuff like budgets or numbers or you're interested in area ministry next steps or dreaming and vision for the future, um, the the fast track is where you'll get just that, the fast track on those kinds of things. You get all that stuff, and it'll happen right after the new year. All kinds of great stuff. 2020 will no doubt be the best year that Journey Church has had to date. It'll be I am really excited about it, and I'm not just excited about it from like a planning perspective or a budget. I'm excited about it from a God thing. God has really been moving in my life, in the lives of leaders, lives of folks who are helping people move forward. I see it in in community, in groups. It's just really amazing and encouraging stuff. 
But we've been working for months to kind of put that budget together. And I want to let you know about a couple of challenges we're going to face. As we look at it, we kind of got it all together and we can look at it kind of planning it out. And we recognize there are really two problems. Let's kind of sum them up like this. One of them I'm going to call budget busters. And the other one I'm going to call cash flow. We'll explain it, okay? Let's talk about that budget busters one first. It's kind of the weird thing. We're a 10-year-old church this year. We'll, we'll celebrate our 10th birthday in 2020. And in that whole kind of scheme of time, we've, you know, acquired a fair amount of equipment around here. And a lot of it, the chairs you're sitting on, the stage we're on, the screens you're looking at, like the sound boards, lots of the computers, most of those are somewhere between six and 10 years old. So we do, I mean, Bryce has really worked hard to make sure that we make those things last as long as humanly possible. But we are, they're on the end of their life, not the beginning. And so he works really hard because we have this code that we live by. And we say we have some codes around here. And one of them is that we'll do the very best with what we have. I was talking with somebody not long ago and they're like, man, I would have no idea that there was a struggle of any kind going on because, man, what I see looks great. And it does because they work really hard. Him and his team work really hard to make sure that everything works as long as possible. He's done a lot of finagling. Take these projectors back here, for instance. He's constantly doing something to switch them, change them out, keep the bulbs going. One time we put bulbs in, 10 minutes later they exploded. Like it happens all the time because they're super old. So in terms of technology, not in terms of my life, I think they're young. <laughs> but, but the thing is that we have this struggle. Now, if you're going to start like taking on all that stuff, it's a big deal because every single one of them are critical for us. Like every single weekend, we use every bit of it all the time. And it would be a huge issue for us if something went out during a week. And so we have to head off those things in advance of those things. You can't just go one, run to Walmart and pick them up. If we lose a projector or we lose an amplifier or we lose something else, it would, it would put us under pretty quick. And think about it, when you develop a budget, there's not a lot of gap between the, between the income and the expenses Man, you hit, you know how the enemy would attack. He attacks the same way he does with you. In comes down, guess what breaks? The car, you know? That's how it works. So we need to plan ahead of time to make sure we head those things off the pass. And to do a good job of that, um, we're looking at a cost of around $40,000. I know you're sucking air, so hold on a minute. There's great news. Um, God has, since before I moved here 10 years ago this month, uh, God has provided a number of relationships um, that God has just leveraged to help us move forward much faster than we normally would be able to as a church. In fact, to date, we've raised a little over a million dollars to help Journey Church launch and move forward. That blows my mind. I mean, from outside of Journey, that kind of uh, resourcing, people just caring about, they get nothing from it. They just care about what God's doing in our lives and through the ministry here. And so they get behind it. And so I've got great news. I was able to take a trip. We came back from our, you know, being away as a family over Thanksgiving. Took a trip up uh, to a handful of folks this last week. And, and I'm great, glad to say um, that God has provided everything we need to be able to accomplish all of those budget busters from outside a journey. That's, that's really, really, yeah, that's really good news. Because what it keeps us from doing is having this problem where all of a sudden a projector goes down and we got to scramble between Tuesday and Sunday, you know, to make it work for the next weekend or a little thing like that. So we'll be able to, up, you'll see a lot of changes up here in the next couple of months. But, but just know that is every single time you see a wire that's new or a projector or something that's new, it's just a picture of God providing again for us. And the other thing we talked about is the second issue is that we've run into uh, what is what we're going to call cash flow. And you know how cash flow goes. It's about money that comes in and money that goes out. It, it's really a, a simple thing, but here's the deal. Since June, our giving from inside of Journey has been down about 20%. And I, that makes it hard to figure out what that means, but that's about $3,000 a week less than we need to operate. So you can imagine if it's been like that since June or July, we've taken quite a hit in those six months, you know? So you average that out or figure it out, it comes out to about $60,000 that we're shy of figuring out how to go. So we've, over the last six months, dipped into reserves a fair amount. And that, you know, that is part of life, right? I mean, it's just how we all operate our lives. When less is coming in, you just figure it out and get through it. 
But what I would hate to see happen for us is for us to get into 2020, our very best year yet, like really excited about it, working together as teams, enabling leaders, communicating at a whole new level, working together as a family, and God calling us to mission, and us just have these constant conversations about, about dollars and pennies, because that's not what ministry is about. Ministry and money, just they have this tense relationship with each other, but it has nothing to do with effectiveness. I believe God has given us every resource we need. We just need to figure out where it's at. So where is our responsibility? What can we do? Um, Bryce and I were talking, and, and he mentioned the end of Titus 3. And it's this beautiful piece of scripture where, where, where he's challenged to say, help God's people prepare so that we can accomplish these difficult tasks that we can do. And that's really what this is about. It's just a family thing. So, so at the end of the day, what we'd love to do is we've already seen God care for all the budget buster issues. Those things that will probably go down in the next 12 months, we'll be able to fix them so that they don't kidnap life and keep us from doing ministry. What we, you and I, need to do, our family, my family and yours, is just simply, really simple. It's just one word. It's pray. Just pray and ask God what he would have you do. Not, not don't like... Don't make a big deal out of it. There's no high pressure, right? There's no like thermometer in the lobby, you know? <laughs> nobody's gonna like, nobody's gonna make a, you know, a phone call and stop by your house with fresh cookies to high pressure you. No, it's not like that. It's just simply a way for you and I over the next few weeks to say, you know, it's the end of the year. It's a great opportunity for us to just push a little above and beyond kind of what we would normally do because we as a church need to raise probably in the neighborhood of twenty or $25,000 in the next few weeks where we can just go, hey, this will free it up. Now listen, we're going to update you. We're going to do all that kind of stuff along the way. But this isn't about dollars and pennies. If this facility tells you anything about this church, this is not about stuff, right? This is, I mean, it's literally a tent. We're fine with that. There's nothing about this that is about dollars and pennies. It's all about two words, faith and obedience. We've been here time and time again. It's always about faith and obedience. So just ask God what he wants you to do. It might be a small number. It might be a big number. It might be no number at all. That's okay. It might come from your pocket. It might come from your checking or your savings. It might come from your retirement. I don't, that's between you and God. It really has nothing to do with me. And I want you to know that we will not only update you, but those updates won't just be about dollars and pennies. They're about ministry. Lives changed. And so I just challenge you to consider that because it's been, uh, it's been a rough year, but man, we are, it's amazing. The energy is great around here. The attendance is great around here. God's been doing great things. We're seeing lives and marriages saved and challenged and changed. We baptized a 91-year-old man a few weeks ago. I mean, that's unbelievable stuff that God is doing. And man, I love being a part of it. And the energy enemy would love to attack us on a huge effort in, the, in terms of finances. So just think about that, because the holidays are a great time to do that. Chris is going to tell you a little bit more about it later, but, but to be fair about it, I want to just kind of give us this, like, other things that, that it's really about around here, and it's really about us being joyful. It's about us squeezing life out of life, not squeezing it out like trying to wring out these useless that's something valuable. It's why we care about dollars and pennies. It's why we talk about stuff like this, because we want to see people used by God to change their lives, and that's what matters to us. It's the reason why holidays are such a great time for us to remind ourselves that we need to find our identity in Jesus, and that's how we find joy. A, a week or so ago, a couple weeks ago, it was, um, took little short family trip. My parents moved to Virginia last June, and so we spent Thanksgiving in June. In, uh, in, we didn't spend Thanksgiving in June. We spent Thanksgiving in Virginia, where my parents live, and we went to all there while we were there to Washington, D.C. I've never been there before. I've, my whole family, none of us have ever been there before. We, we thought it was like, if you asked me to draw it, I would have messed it up, right? Because I would have drawn like, you know, the White House, and then a reflecting pool, and it was all maybe 30 yards apart, you know? It's not like that. If you've ever been there, it's a, it's a lot of walking, right? We got off of the train, and we hoofed it all over the place. You're up here and over there. We walked like eight or nine miles a day. It was terrible. I don't know if this is obvious, but I don't walk like that. That's a terrible thing. So I'm like, so we were walking to all these places. I went to the Washington Monument. We went to the Lincoln Memorial. We went to the Capitol. We went to the White House. We went to all these different places. The coolest place was the National Archives. 
The rotunda at the National Archives is unbelievable. If you haven't seen National Treasure, that's the only experience I had with it, was him in there with this video camera. They won't let you take in there. But, but I was in there, and I got to see the Constitution. The Constitution of the United States. I mean, this document that founded who we are. And as I was looking at it, right next to it, there's these plaques, you know. And I'm not one for reading plaques, to be honest with you, you know. Because when I go to the zoo, I'm like, bear, let's go. You know, pig, let's go. Like... This right here, that's a monkey. There's a lot of them. Let's go over here. They'll throw poop at you. Like, that's not, so, but Bryce hates that about going to the zoo with me. But, but like, when I saw the, the Constitution, I was just taken aback by it. I was reading some of the plaques and the information next to it. And I was reading about the influence that this one document, the Magna Carta, had on the, influ- on, on, on the writing of the Constitution of the United States. And then I was thinking, wait a minute. That, that's a, like a chapter in the Bible. There's this, there's this chapter in the Bible called Romans chapter 8 where, um, where we've called it like the Magna Carta of Scripture. And I'm like, hey, wait a minute. There's a connection, and I don't understand it. And I realized that words that stand up against tyranny, words that bring out freedom, they, they resound in our hearts and they make a difference in our lives. And that's what's going on in Romans chapter 8. And so when, when King John penned the words of the Magna Carta and he said, like, there's no more, there's no more tyranny that's going to lord over you. And when the writers of the Constitution wrote down that we, the people of the United States, in order to form them a perfect union, right, declare these things to be true, right? That's amazing, and they're inspirational to us. But what I love to think is that the Constitution was influenced by the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta, in my mind, had to be influenced by Romans chapter 8 because there's this, there's this similar rhythm and value to the words that are in there. Every single word uh, of Romans chapter 8 is just fire, right? It's clearly one of the most pivotal chapters in all of the Bible. Martin Luther said it was the most important chapter of all of Scripture. And it starts out with these powerful words where we can find joy because we, you and I, can be joyful. Not squeeze life out of these little moments. Not make every single dollar work. Not like, I gotta, I gotta just have a little more to drink so that I can have a little bit of life. I can just gotta do this so I can. We can be joyful because there is no condemnation for us. That's what the, the first verse in Romans chapter 8 says. It says, there is no condemnation, right, for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that's a big deal, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It starts off that way. So now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That, that's a big deal for us. Because you and I have to get that. I mean, look at this verse. I, I want you to kind of just look at the way it's phrased. Because it says this, so now there is no condemnation. Put that one. Are we stuck? Because it looks like it's not working quite right. There we go. Romans 8, we're at So now there is that word no. Now, I, we, I did like some Greek study. I don't do this often, right? But what that word no means is none. Go figure. Isn't that kind of weird? Like it means no condemnation. That means that, that means that you and I, if we are, and this is the important part about it, that other part of it, if we belong to Christ Jesus, other fr- translations say the word in Christ. That's a, a, a consistent phrase you see through scripture. But it really means exactly what this one says. If you and I belong to Jesus, if we're part of the family of God, then when we walk with him, there is no condemnation. You know how we feel like just a little bit guilty? Like, oh man, if I wouldn't have, if I didn't, if I hadn't, if I wouldn't have been a part of that, man, there's no condemnation. There is no, there is no condemnation for the things in your past. And I want us to get something that's very important here, right? It's, it's vitally important to who we are, is that there's no condemnation for the things in the future. When I say like, when I make the joke that the word no means none, it really means none. It means that you and I walk with Jesus in freedom, just like we walk with our parents and, and, and the people who love us, dearly love us. We're able to experience a freedom to go, look, I, I don't have to work to accomplish his love. God loves me. We belong to him. We're going to talk more about that in a second, but it, it's so important that we get, that we can't squeeze any more life out of life. 
right? We can't grab life by the neck and wring out any one moment of real valuable life from our hobbies, from our stuff, from our money, from our, 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 our world around us. We can't get any valuable life out of life. Our joy, our life comes from Jesus. And that's what the rest of the chapter just kind of keeps finding this rhythm of, of truth and joy in our lives because we're joyful because we have God's Spirit in us. Like once we belong to Him, we have God's Holy Spirit. And I gotta be honest with you, I grew up in a church where the Holy Spirit, we just didn't talk about that, right? Like we would sing it in songs occasionally, but we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. Now some of you grew up, like I grew up Baptist, right? And so, and some of you grew up on the other end of the spectrum. You grew up like Pentecostal, right? Like you're looking at these chandeliers and going, man, how are we gonna get all the way up there to swing from those? Right? Like, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I had a friend once who goes, who uh, we was at a Methodist church, and he came in and he goes, he says, uh, he says, man, that's like a four man chandelier. That's awesome. So, <laughs> but like some of us grew up in different Holy Spirit backgrounds. My church didn't talk about the Holy Spirit much because we kind of were scared of him, right? It was kind of like your weird uncle. You don't invite him to stuff because you're not sure what he's going to do. So that's kind of how we were. Some of you grew up on the other end of the spectrum. The truth of it is that God's Holy Spirit is a critical piece of our faith because when we accept Jesus, we don't just get Jesus like secures our eternity. We get the indwelling of the Spirit. God's Holy Spirit, this, this is who God really is, lives inside of us. Look at Romans 8, 11. It's so valuable. He says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that's a lot of work, right? I mean, this is pretty powerful stuff. He lives in you. And that's what we were talking about in a minute ago. Like, just there's this victory that the, that the baby boy brings us. We have this tendency to think of this baby in a manger, but we forget that that's the same Jesus that's on the cross. This baby brings the victory, and it's God's Holy Spirit that works in it, and he lives in us. And he says this, and just as God raised Jesus from the dead, he'll give you life, to give life to your, my, mortal bodies. Not just eternal life. Life here. Real life. Life. That's where joy comes from. Jesus said it. Like, I came so that you could have life and you could have it abundantly. I want you to have life that overflows. Life you can't stop talking about. Life that's worth living. I don't know about you, but I've tried to wring all the life out of the stuff, right? I've tried to wring the life out of my hobbies. I've tried to wring life out of just my stuff. I've tried to wring, wring all the life I could get out of family and all those things. And they're great things but never found the life that Jesus promises until we find it in who he is in us. So we already get this. I mean, as we walk through, and you should read Romans chapter 8 today. I mean, it'd be a great next step out of today because we find joy all throughout it. The Spirit of God living in us. And here's this best, but the next part about it, about how you and I can live this out. Look at what it says. So letting your sinful nature, this just backs up a couple of verses. It says, so letting your sinful, sinful natures control your minds leads to death. We've all been there, haven't we? Like, I don't know about you, but I've been there. I've been there where I'm like, oh, my, my desires, my stuff, my sinful nature controlling how I think, it leads me down a path that keeps me far from anything that's valuable, doesn't it? But it doesn't usually just kidnap us and toss us into the deep end, does it? I've said this before, but nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw my whole life in the toilet today, right? Nobody gets up and goes, you know what we're going to do? Start cooking meth in a trailer. It's going to be awesome, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says that stuff. What we do is we just, sim we just slowly live out a life that is just less than what God has for us. And we try to squeeze every ounce of enjoyment out of our things, out of our surroundings, out of our relationships, out of our, like, indulgences and all this stuff. And we just try to do it. And what he's saying is when we let our sinful nature control the way we think, it leads us to death. And death is not the kind of life that Jesus wants for us. I mean, look at what it says next. He said, but letting the Spirit control your minds leads to life and peace. That's what joy's about. I mean, that's what is so valuable about this time of year. It's what's so valuable about Christmas, is it gives us an opportunity to experience joy 
and life and peace, everything that God can have for you. So listen, in the next couple of weeks, it's going to unfold. You're going to have time around families. I'm so sorry you have to go through that. Like, you're going to have all these difficult things that you're going to face. Some of you facing Christmas the first time without your husband, without your wife, without your parents, without somebody you love. This is maybe the 10th time you've faced it. It's terrible. But letting your sinful desire control that part of you that just finds your way back into that sorrowful rhythm it brings out death letting letting your the god's holy spirit control the way you think leads you to life and peace i don't know about you but i want more of that i want to stop trying to wring life out of life i want to find and experience abundant life where i don't have to work so hard to experience it and that is what scripture says so it's true in my life. I meet it in all of yours and lots and lots of your stories where God, ex- where you experience God giving you life to spare, right? With, with plenty to go around, not having to figure out how to eke out one more day. Spirit lives in us. And the last thing before we wrap up, I and mean, just kind of towards the end of the chapter, is we're joyful because we're God's kids. You know, I was talking this week with folks. I mean, like I mentioned, I, I don't know if this is real obvious, but I don't really like talking about this money stuff. I, I really honestly hate it. It, it. I wish it would just take care of it. And it. But here's the deal. I'm confident. Like at the end of the day, I'm really confident in it. Because, not because it's like all the circumstances have worked out or because all, I don't know. I just know this. I, I love my dad. I love my earthly dad. But my heavenly father, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's a Bible way of saying that he owns everything. And I don't really worry about it. I mean, I worry. I concern myself. I worry about the little numbers. I stress out about it a little bit. But to be honest with you, I don't ultimately worry about it because it's really not mine. It's my, it's my dad's. I don't have to worry about it. Look at what Romans 8 says towards, towards the end of the chapter. It's one, been lately one of the best verses that I've landed on. It says this, For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. There's some there's some value in that, isn't there? I mean, just think for a minute how much you love your children. I mean, it's tough for us sometimes, isn't it? Because we start thinking children of God, we think father, we think our earthly fathers. And I don't know about you, I love my earthly father, but he is an imperfect person, just like I am. But think about how you love your kids, if you have kids. How you love your nieces and nephews. How you love those people that are really close to you. You would do anything for them. Right? I mean, like, you'd go to jail. Those boys who like my daughter, just keep that in mind. But like, like, <laughs> like I mean, that's, you'd do anything for your kids. You love them more than you can even put words to. And those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And you've received a spirit, it says, that makes you fearful slaves. You've not received the spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Fearful of God. Like if, he, if you do something wrong, he's going to throw a lightning bolt at you. I have this image of God that I grew up with that has God. He's like a cosmic killjoy. Like he's just waiting in heaven going, no, that's too much fun. If you do that, it's too much fun. It's probably wrong, and I'm going to throw something at you. And I just felt like growing up, and probably most of my adult life, I felt like God is sitting up in heaven waiting for me to enjoy something just a little too much so that he could tell me to quit. And, and that's not what we see here. You've not received a spirit that makes you a fearful slave, but instead you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own child. That, that's powerful stuff, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but that's been really encouraging to me because there's no way that I'd let my kids go into anything and want. I'd give them anything. I mean, I, they may not always appreciate it. They may not always get it. They may not know, know what it costs, right? That's what Christmas is all about, it seems like, from the parents' perspective, is giving our kids gifts that they don't understand fully. They mean so much. They cost us so much more than they'll ever realize. But the truth of it is, that's exactly what God does. God gives like crazy, and there's no way he's going to let his kids need. It just doesn't happen. But we don't think of it that way, do we? And I think it's because we often see God as the Godfather rather than God the Father. You, you ever think about it that way? Like God's this, you know, guy sitting under a a light, and if you do something that makes him mad, he's like, you're dead to me, right? Just kind of 
put out the orders to put you to death. But that's not how he is. He's our father. He loves us. He delights. I mean, like, here's the deal. This is what gives me life, is that I know that I'm not trying to navigate, trying to avoid. If I do this, he'll be mad at me. If I do this, he'll, he'll judge me. If I do that, if I sidestep, if I just pick the wrong thing, I'm out of, his, out of the center of his will. You ever hear that phrase, right? Out of the center of his will, and that he doesn't like it when you're out of the center of his will, and he's going he's gonna to pass judgment on me. Let me ask you this. How do you treat your kids? If they ask your opinion, like, hey, dad, hey, mom. You know, I've been really struggling through this thing lately, and, and I just want to make a good decision. What do you think? Don't you just like, isn't that part of your, some of you are like, oh, that would be amazing, right? I mean, you'd be like blown away. There's, how do you think God feels? When we just sit down and say, hey, God, I've just been really struggling through this temptation in my life. I've really been struggling through this problem in my life. I'm really, this is a tough season for me, God. I just, I just need to be fathered by you. I just need to be loved cared for, nurtured, protected by you. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff like that in Romans chapter 8. I mean, I really believe that if you and I could just take a few minutes and just slowly walk through, there's no condemnation. We are, we are dearly loved and forgiven by God. And that you and I have a spirit dwelling in us and that we're his children. And that we're much loved children of God. There's power in that stuff. I think we'd start to understand that our hope, our joy, doesn't come from what we think or feel about Jesus. It comes from who we are in Jesus. Your identity in Jesus matters more than anything else in this whole holiday picture. Because it's just like what Bryce and the band sang about earlier. That endless hope relentless joy came to us in a baby boy. Let's pray together. Jesus, there's just all kinds of stuff that is wrapped up in here, things we love talking about, things we hate talking about. But God, we just, uh, we just bring it all to you. Um, the financial stuff, but mostly our lives. We just bring it to you and just, we just take our hands off of it. We just release it to you. And we know that we have value to you and that you'd never let your kids need a single thing. And that you're not waiting to pounce down on us, punish us, that you love us, and that we are your children. And that we're thankful for and it brings us joy. And we ask in your name. Amen.